interesting, strange modifications of RNA. So along those lines, I'm going to walk you through some of the other work we do in the lab that's also about mapping uh, mysterious microbes. But I'm going to start first with how is it that we can do some of this mapping and discovery, and then also, as you'll learn about for the microbe directory, how do we do annotation? How do we better understand these organisms? Uh, and at the end of the talk, I'll take you over to Mars by the end. And so we'll, we'll start on Earth, we'll end up on Mars, uh, and uh, I'll take you with on a little adventure. But I'll start with, first is uh, how we can do all this mapping is that, th is that the cost of sequencing has come down phenomenally fast over the past 15 years. So in particular, if you look here, this is the chart of what's the cost to sequence one human genome, which is 3 billion letters long. You can see it used to be hundreds of millions of dollars. And in the mid noughties or I would call like the, the not not the middle of the last uh, decade, it got really cheap due to a mixture of competition and some innovation and new technologies that could, instead of looking at one molecule of DNA or RNA at a time, could look at billions at a time. So the cost to do a large scale chemical reaction that would sequence DNA suddenly and precipitously dropped. So we could actually now sequence a whole human genome for something that's in some cases less than the cost of a, of a complicated x-ray. And so, you know, $1,000 now recently it's been announced is about five or $600. So you can get the totality of your genetic code sequenced and annotated uh, for really cheap. You know, it was talked about a few thousand dollars. Uh, Illumina is still saying some points, you know, it'd be a hundred dollars, you know, something that is less than the cost of an expensive night of drinks in Manhattan, for example, or not even expensive, like one round of drinks, depending on where you go. So, you know, it is, uh, it could be very cheap. And so what this means is it's very cheap to sequence human genomes. We can embed this into clinical care. We can have what is often called genome guided medicine, which actually guides decision making uh, for uh, cancer as well as general uh, clinical disease, inherited disease. And what this also means is that with all its sequencing capacity, it's so cheap that every day generates more data than any other day before. And so we have more capacity for discovery, more ability, a greater ability to actually discover new organisms or better understand existing ones. It literally means that every day is actually the best day ever to be a geneticist uh, every time I wake up. So it's really, uh, it, it's worth remembering that. So it's exciting in the shower, you might have like a sad moment in the shower, just doing your shampoo. But my shower is generally very exciting because I'm excited to start today because every day is the best day ever. Uh, but uh, as a geneticist, that is, it uh, doesn't mean every day I uh, always have the best day of my life, but at least in terms of capacity, that's true. But uh, that's from the human genome perspective, but of course there's more than one genome. And in fact, if you could look at what the room looks like around you, for example, and view it through the lens of the microbiome, I feel like you can see bacteria, viruses, fungi, spores, uh, other sort of little microorganisms floating around. This is what a good rendering, uh, this is from Jessica Green's lab, would look like if you could look at your office. So you can see every place you put your hand leaves a microbial and sort of genetic residue. Every time you move your body, it sort of shifts these, these cells and sort of this dust around your skin has this microbiome. Every time you breathe out, it has its own aerosolized microbiome. A lot of us are thinking about that right now with COVID. You can think about your GI tract has its own rich microbiome. You can see even like your, your chair or it's like about your desk. Other areas uh, of your room can and will have these microbial little ecosystems. Even if you think like a cup that keeps your pencils. If you throw a pencil into a cup, you'll get, when you do that, basically a puff of microbes and human cells that kind of pops up and then moves around the air. And even the buildings in which we live and work have their own what is often called a built environment microbiome, or just the microbiome of what's in this, the buildings, the subways, the cities uh, in which we're all living and running around. So, so this is really this entire ecosystem that's only scantily been really understood. And if you can just look at the human body, of course you have your human cells, but we're covered in microbes, of course. They add up about three to five pounds of your body, depending on how big you are. Uh, and they actually they comprise a lot of your ecosystem too, about a third of the small molecules in your blood transit through it and made by the microbiome or modified by the microbiome and so it's really this entire ecosystem and pharmacy that's right in your gut that contributes to some of your own physiology and this has been you know this has been known for a long time but it's been more acutely manifest more recently in particular work from the human microbiome project and a lot of related consortia efforts have shown that obesity uh diet uh, processing uh inflammatory bowel disease other diseases like you know think of uh, autoimmune diseases asthma allergies those things make sense, but then even depression, uh, autism, different sort of uh, more neuropsychiatric disorders have been viewed more recently through the lens of the microbiome as having a potential uh, impact. And so there's really kind of a, a new era where we're not just thinking about one discipline of science and examining it, we're thinking about multiple disciplines. So in particular, you know, for example, if you look at just at cancer, uh, you used to think of there's a cancer, it might be resistant to chemotherapy, but in this one of my favorite papers showed that in this case, 
the cancer was resistant to the chemotherapy because of a bacteria inside the tumor. So like intratumor bacteria that would fight the cancer. So you may, in this case, first treat with antibiotics and then treat the, the cancer. So you think about a cross kingdom interaction of what's actually driving uh, oncogenesis. And so the other thing you can think about is like when you take a drug, what happens to the bacteria in your gut? So actually about a quarter of the drugs in the market that have human targets uh, actually modified at least one strain in in vitro test that maybe when you take a drug for you, you're also taking it for your bacteria. So it really points towards this little pharmacy uh, that's being like, modified by the drugs you take, but they also make their own drugs. And so you can even, there's a really beautiful paper from 2014 by Michael Fishback and Mohamed Dani that showed when you look at what's just in the normal gut flora, you can find new organisms that are making these small molecules you can see. And so this gives you a way to find, you know, biosynthetic gene clusters or BGCs that gives you, you know, essentially a, a functional analysis of what new drugs might look like. And so I'll come back to this later. But it means that, you know, there's, there's human drugs, there's bacterial drugs, they are constantly interacting with each other. And so, for example, if you're a human geneticist, which is what my training is in, to be a human geneticist, you actually have to really be sort of a, a more of a cross kingdom geneticist, or else you're actually a really bad geneticist because you're looking at only one kingdom of life or one domain of life. Uh, so this is a sort of the new paradigm of medicine uh, that comes up all the time in, in clinic and in the sort of pathology review meetings. And so, you know, this is within a clinical context, but there's other places where mysterious microbes can and will have an influence. And so some of them are places we study in something called the Extreme Microbiome Project, which uh, Maria and Krista work on and organize and, and lead this effort is, you know, we think about places where, for example, this lake, it's a candy pink bright lake in Australia called Lake Hillier. And it's so, you know, essentially the salinity is so high when you step into the water, it hurts your skin because it's basically, it's a hypertonic solution that's lysing your cells. And if you go to the shore and just grab some of the sort of the soil at the beginning of the shoreline, you'll see huge uh, crystals. These are just salt crystals that are picked up there. And so what's amazing is some organisms uh, actually live there just fine. Like Daniela Salina doesn't mind it there at all. Actually, yeah, even thrives there. And it's part of the reason the lake is so pink. Uh, so we've been looking at other pink lakes around the world to understand some other and unique ecosystems. But we've also been looking in other places. So for example, we're looking in with Scott Ty in Antarctica. You can see him here when he landed in the selection site. He got out the laptop and the sampler and started actually sequencing the DNA there. We've also been looking at you know, other locations, like in, in closer to home, like in New York City, the Gowanus Canal is, you know, is actually a super fun site. So it's heavily polluted and is being cleaned up by the government, uh, by the EPA. Uh, and that's a super fun, not super fun site. And you can see here what it looks like. It's full of raw sewage and toxic chemicals, but we're looking there because things can and do live there. And overall, trying to better understand the gradients uh, of the plasticity of life on Earth to, you know, to better understand maybe what it looks like on other planets. I'll get to that eventually. So you can see we well, was an ongoing project to better understand microbes. And so when you start looking at the microbe directory features, this is one of the key questions is where has something originally, where was it originally discovered? What might that indicate about what it's likely, you know, ability to survive in different environments looks like? And then can we use that to better understand new organisms that we discover? And so, for example, a new organism that a lot of you are familiar with is actually, you know, what can happen with COVID-19. It's actually uh, the dashboard here from Johns Hopkins. You can tell me that we have uh, now millions and millions of cases, over a million deaths, actually. And so it used to be when you think about the subway, you wouldn't think about the subway being a place to discover extreme microbes. But if you think about it, it kind of is because it's organisms that have to survive cleaning and living on steel surfaces. And some people were, were afraid of it before the pandemic. But after the pandemic, I've seen people wearing gloves. I saw a few people even before, but you can see like people uh, often not wearing gloves and masks when they go ride the subway. Uh, and we, we've been studying the subways for a, quite a while, a few years, and my interest in it really came back in the early 2010s when my daughter, whom I shamelessly use in my talks, got old enough to ride the subway. You can see her, she was grabbing a pole. She actually licked a subway pole, which I had a moment of real terror, really, of like, why did she lick the subway pole, and what did that do? And clearly there had been a microbial transfer, something had happened when she did that, and I really just wanted to know what it was. So I went back and looked online, and there had never been a microbial map put together of a metropolis. There'd been no genetic map of a city. There really, uh, this you know, metropolome, if you will, had not been created. So I started to say, well, what if we start to make it? So we started to work on this project back in 2013, went up and collected samples from all, uh, every single subway station, all 468 in triplicate across the city, brought them back to the lab, did a timestamp, a geotag, extracted the, RNA, the DNA, and then sequenced them, and then actually compared every fragment of DNA to every known organism, and saw what we could find. And one of my favorite things is that on average, half of the DNA matched no known organism. 
had never been seen before. We don't know where it is, where it came from until we did this study. Uh, and as really this extraordinary amount of like half the world number index being unknown is right, right before our eyes. Whereas, you know, the things we could map like pseudomonas, different species of pseudomonas, we could map them here and quickly detail their density. But this meant that there was a large, uh, you know, catalog of, of things left to discover. So for example, if we look in the Gowanus Canal, again, going back there is what it looks like. Uh, we could pick up a lot of methanogen. There was actually a methanogen heaven. These archaea that survive in there. Some of that's coming from the raw sewage. And you might think, you know, who, that seems like an awful place. You should probably not swim in there. A guy did confirm this a few years ago that it's not safe to swim in there because it's full of raw sewage and toxins. Even in a hazmat suit, it was not a good idea, just as a quick uh, public service announcement. But from that data, we've been pleasantly haunted by this question of, you know, who is there and what are they making? What are these organisms doing? And can we learn more about them and, and find where else they are in the world? Uh, so, you know, for example, if you find things that you think came from one place, they could help inform what happened to a, a new place. So like, a good example I like to give is, you know, the species area is different in different parts of the city, right? So you've got enteric bacteria, you've got staph, you've got Pseudoeltomonas, which is a pretty unique species. But then this was one species among several that was only found in this one subway station. So when we look at the data, well, that's interesting. What was that one? It turns out this was the one that we worked with the MTA to get access to that was flooded by Hurricane Sandy and had 10 species that weren't seen anywhere else uh, in the subway system. And so what we wanted to know is, you know, is this like sort of a and a remnant or a molecular echo of what happened in that station. So, you know, if you, any of you remember Hurricane Sandy, it hit New York City, it came through in 2012. It was actually knocked off part of the NIH's website that day. And then also, you know, huge waves came through the city. At some parts, he, uh, parts of the city got really hit hard with water. I don't know if any of you were in the city at that time, but, you know, really giant waves coming through. I'm just kidding. That wasn't that wasn't really true. This was from the day after tomorrow. If you haven't seen the movie, but it didn't quite get this bad, but it did feel this bad. And in particular, the subway is the actual map of the subway where in gray the lines got knocked out or were unaccessible because of the damage either to the tracks or to the actually the systems themselves. So, for example, South Ferry Station looked like this after the hurricane. It was completely submerged in water. So we went with the MTA to try and track down. Okay, well, what was there? Could we swab the walls and the floors and see what was left behind? And indeed, we can pick up species like Shuanella frigida marina. It's actually previously thought to be an Antarctic species, and it can make something called eicosapentaenoic acid. And we found it on the walls of the subway. And actually, it normally grows anaerobically when it's left behind, and it's normally something you'd find with fish uh, when you find it either with fish or because they're making EPA. So it's like it's like interesting. That's actually kind of an uh, interesting note. And and if you're at low, if you have low levels of EPA in your diet, you could be at a higher risk for suicide. So you could argue that maybe uh, this is a, a positive feature. Like if you uh, think about my daughter looking at pole, maybe it's not so bad. Uh, and I did have a, um, a uh, reporter once say, well, Dr. Mason, okay, should, so should I look a, lick a pole or, or not? Is it safe to do, what, what's, the, what's the ruling? And I gave a very long answer. Well, you know, it depends on what's there, how long it's been there. Do you have, you know, uh, you know, if your mouth, it's a mucous membrane, so that's different from like your skin and assuming you don't have any cuts, you know, it really depends on what's there. You know, on average, you know, it, it's, it's probably fine. It's pro probably okay, but it really depends on, on what's there and day-to-day uh, -day variation. Um, and so the only thing that appeared the next day uh, on the headline was just, just this headline is that basically it's probably fine. So I stand by this statement because it's still statistically true. Odds are it's fine, but I also stand by it because We've learned a lot that, you know, you know, if you don't have exposure to the microbiome, especially when you're younger, it's detrimental to your immune system. One of the best examples of this is if you think about peanut allergies, this is one of a trial that was published a few years ago and then replicated two years later. This is the first trial that showed that if you're a child and you start to get allergic to peanuts, it seems rational to just take away all the peanut butter. Don't get any access to peanuts at all. And that seems like the safest thing to do. It's, it seems rational, right? But it's actually not the best thing to do. The, the worst thing to do is to keep exposing the, the kid to no peanuts, actually. What you want is low level exposure uh, and actually continue a little bit of exposure to the peanuts. And that's actually what is a decrease the risk for asthma and the allergies later in life. And this was again replicated by two other groups uh, the following two years. And so that means that in general, licking poles is, is maybe not so bad or exposure to the environment. It's what's called the hygiene hypothesis that you do need exposure to the environment, including uh, allergens and, at low levels. Uh, but this does not apply during pandemics. Uh, since we're in a pandemic, I always like to add this uh, note here. Okay, so that's um, what we've published a little bit before, but now looking forward, where else could we look for interesting organisms? So we've been working with the Gates Foundation and WorldQuant for the past five years uh, to find antimicrobial resistance and to use this meta sub network to actually track different organisms around the world. 
is a project called Metasub, or the Metagenomics and Design of Subways and Urban Biomes. And we're building out these maps of metagenomics and antimicrobial resistance markers, and then also biosynthetic gene clusters are tracking where these BGCs move around the world. You can see updates from our, our collections to date, actually, and Krista, we have to update the final number for 2020 at some point, but it's over well over 5,000. We've been continuing to collect across the world for the past five years and are building this map out until uh, at least 2024. So is it midway through a really large scale effort to really build genetic maps of what's in the world around us? And what's great about this is what we found is some really extraordinary things. So for example, taking some of these data and putting them into what are called metagenome assembled genomes, or can you like reconstruct the new species, increase the tree of life by threefold. And we've actually already found 10,000 new, almost 11,000 new uh, DNA viruses that weren't ever known before. The other thing is if we look at the new sort of small peptides that are there, the proteins that are present in these data, here too, we found about 4.3 million new peptides, new fragments of proteins that are being made uh, by these organisms that they've never seen before. So really the amount of just pure discovery is really uh, exceptional in terms of if you sequence the world around you, you'll find lots of new things. And the thing is, the back, we're finding you know, new peptides, we're finding new bacteria, the new bacteria are fighting the new viruses, and we can actually see that these new viruses are sort of echoing what's in their data with other viruses in their CRISPR arrays. Remember, CRISPR is kind of the version of a bacterial immune system, which Jennifer Dowden just got the Nobel for this week, uh, well, de uh, well deserved uh, Nobel. And so this is, you know, these types of CRISPR systems and these arrays, we're actually discovering new ones right out of the subways and right out of the different environmental data. So this uh, simple process of sequencing and annotating has already been very informative for discovering uh, new CRISPR elements as well. And CRISPR arrays. So that's at the like the functional units, but we're even getting more granular than that. And just say, if I see a fragment of DNA, or what's kind of like a, a 21 or 25 nucleotide fragment of ACGT, and I make a map of it around the world, we've built this global KMER index where if you type in any sequence, you can figure out where it came from in the world and where else you've seen it uh, based on this map. And this is important for a few reasons: is that as many organisms are still unknown, as I've just shown you we can at least start to build an association of, well, what kind of environment are they found in or what other organisms are they often found with? So we can do sort of guilt by association annotation for different species. And so this is something that's important just for better understanding of the earth, but it also links to something that's happening for a larger project that deals with planetary protection or really planetary genomics. So in particular, there's an ongoing race to get to the moon and then back to Mars by 2035. And you know, where it's not just the United States, many other groups are heading towards, towards the moon and Mars. Uh, China, India, Israel are sending organisms there. This is the Chiang 4 that landed on the far side of the moon. And so they grow, grew cotton last year on the moon. So if you think of, could I get, you know, uh, cotton linens from the moon? You can't yet, but maybe someday you could. And if you think, well, for example, I want to go to the moon and I, I would like to have my job in the future be, I want to be a lunar architect. That too is actually a legit real job. Here's an example of a architectural firm that is currently designing the moon bases that will be propped up in probably 2025 or 2026. Uh, you can see here this number rendering what it's going to be. So if you think I want to be a lunar architect, that is a legit job you can have. And so it's a really exciting time to think about what's going to be built there. But we bring our microbes with us. New microbes will be selected for in different pressures here on this environment, and they will change. And it's not only ones on the moon. Other ones that we've been thinking about that we're sending to Mars uh, are also ones that might be on the spacecraft we built. This is a picture from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, we work often with Ben Cat. Uh, you can see here I put a picture of him up there. Uh, where they build them and we're swabbing and sequencing different spacecrafts as they're being built. And here you can actually see, you know, different equipment variations. You think, well, they must keep it pretty clean. They're wearing these clean suits, but you know, they're not perfectly sealed. And you know, they, you look closely like they're putting them together. And they, they, they're okay, but, but they can't resist their people. They'll take a selfie with their, with their robot that they're sending to Mars. Like we, we would do the same thing probably. So what this means is if you think about things, you know, on the rovers or on the space station, they have their own built environment microbiome, but it's a space environment microbiome. And when we think about sending someone to Mars, the thing you have to imagine is what if we you know, go to Mars, which we're planning to do probably in the next five to six years for more probes, and hopefully in about 15 years with the boots on the red planet, the goal is to actually collect samples from Mars and bring them back to Earth. This is a picture, it's a beautiful rendering of one of the craters on Mars. And if we go there and the first thing we do is bring it back and sequence the DNA to see, well, did we find a microbe on Mars and what did it look like? What's the closest thing that it looks like based on everything we know about the totality of life on Earth? Uh, we're gonna do that. That's the first thing we're gonna do, uh, working with NASA on this. And then we're also gonna see, well, we, so let's check the spacecraft to make sure we didn't just sequence something that was on the face of an engineer that was building this, the spacecraft. So we're gonna do both those things, compare to every piece of sequence DNA that's, that we've ever characterized from the clean room, as well as anything that's ever been seen on Earth and see if it's truly unique, if it's truly distinct, if we do have any evidence of life, 
Is it something we just brought with us? Is it evidence of panspermia? Where did it come from? All these questions that can, we can do now with the sequence information, but we also need to do it in the context of, well, what do we know about this organism? Is it an extreme file? Can it survive the vacuum of space and then get there and then maybe be brought back to Earth again? That would be good to know as a candidate, as a way to maybe filter it out that it could have been a contaminant. It's what's called planetary protection. And it goes two ways. Planetary protection is we want to protect Mars from anything that we would bring there. And we want to protect Earth from anything that we could bring back uh, to from Mars that might potentially contaminate Earth or uh, carry a pathogen. So uh, all this is, you know, everything from the most simplest of uh, tissue infections to the most complicated of planetary protection protocols. It all depends on sequencing and good annotation and all of you are going to help make that a reality. So I want to thank, of course, World Quantum Gates Foundation particularly for this work, plus NASA and also the NIH for their funding. And thanks, of course, to Krista uh, and Maria who make this possible. And thanks to everyone else in the lab, as well as many collaborators and friends. And I want to stay on for a few minutes uh, for some questions as well. And again, this is a picture of the lab back when we used to be able to actually hang out together in person. So someday soon that'll happen again. So thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time. And I'm happy to take a few questions. Thank you, Chris. Um, is there any any question about uh, all of this incredible research that uh, Thanks, Chris Maria is... and Krista. They, they've seen me give this talk now three three or four times to the, to the different classes. <laughs> so uh, hopefully it still still brings a little something every time. Um, any any questions? Um, yeah, so I have to know this. Oh. Sounds like somebody can hear you. Is it, there is a question in the chat box. Uh, about the uh, children who grew up in the rural areas have fewer allergies because they are exposed to outside stuff than kids who grew in urban areas. Uh, yes, that is the likely presumption. And it is, uh, there's been more diversity that's been mapped in rural areas than urban, not dramatically, but there is more. And some of it's also just that they uh, do get to get, you know, kind of their hands dirty. There is, there is some uh, of that feature. And so um, uh, this has even led to something um, where people want to do, uh, if, if you haven't heard of this, but you can actually do, uh, you know, basically after cesarean section is to like coat babies with the vaginal microbiome. Cause like even at birth, they were missing going through the birth canal. They didn't quite get the sort of deposition and sort of seeding of what would normally occur during vaginal birth. And so there's ongoing studies that even start as early as the first day you're born. Um, oh, life on Venus. Uh, yes, it does pertain to the work. So there, uh, you know, some of the trace gases that were observed in Venus a few weeks ago uh, are, are either some new geochemical process or microbially derived. And so phosphine might be being made by microbes, but it'd have to be like probably in the clouds of Venus. And so it's not possible, but that's, that's actually part of some of the annotations, depending on what species some of you get. Uh, there are annotations of organisms that survive at really low pressure or high altitude. Um, yeah, yeah, so... Um, uh, to carry out experiments on the microbes' ability to survive on Mars could be time-consuming and long. Uh, it could be, uh, but that's the best kind of experiment, something that lasts past your own lifetime. That's a good thing. Um, the uh, <laughs> people, a lot of LOLs. I don't know what everyone was laughing at in particular. Something happened at, I said something at 3. Well, I don't know what was happening at 3.30. I, I think it was about the movie. Uh, oh, the okay, okay, the yeah. good, good, okay, so good. there is this question about how uh, would we took the samples uh, from the subway study. Oh, these and are using yeah, flock swabs. I can see the question there. So flock swabs that actually pick up the sample and it's a sterile swab. It's DNA free because the other thing is if you sequence DNA, DNA is everywhere, right? We're on a biosphere, right? So you have to be careful. You have to do negative controls. We have to do, we, we collect it, but so it's very low input, like low biomass, but you just swab it basically. So it's just kind of like a Q-tip, but it's a nylon uh, DNA free swab. Uh, oh, random. So we try and uh, swab kiosks and turnstiles and also um, uh, benches when we can. Those are the three locations that are most common across all subways in the world. Subways is kind of a funny place to look, but uh, back in the day, I used to ride the subway every day to lab. So I, uh, this is one of those things where I wanted to know what was there. And then we kept finding interesting things. So we keep going. Um, well, oh, do people look at you funny? Yes, we swab for about three minutes, which is about the perfect balance of time to collect enough DNA, but also to avoid too much social discomfort and weirdness. And we've had people who've gotten detained in uh, Austria last year. Someone got detained and it uh, looks like uh, Alina got arrested, but really she was just detained. Uh, but then when she was detained, she actually swabbed the police station. So that was actually a good sample, I'd say. Um, yeah, people look at you funny. But people have been looking at me funny since I was like six years old. So that's, that's fine. I've been saying that for a while. <laughs> 
Uh, all right. Uh, so thank you so much, Chris, for uh, your incredible talk. Uh, we're going to move into the micro directory now. Great, great. And take, take, um, the, take the reins. I'm, I'm heading off to another meeting uh, actually to talk about actually a really interesting microbiome transplant study uh, and mouse models of it. So I'll, I'll be back soon. And um, uh, oh, one last question. Do certain areas correspond to certain diseases? We've seen a little bit of this. There's definitely each region of the world has its, a little bit of a unique microbiome. We've seen that from some of the meta sub data too. So, uh, you know, every, the same way if you go into a different place, um, and it smells different or it looks different. You can see different megafauna, megaflora. It's the same thing microbially as well. I uh, see the same thing. Um, yeah. I think uh, attend all the meetings you can, I guess. So, Miriam, take that. But a pleasure to see you all. Thank you all for your help in advance. You're helping to literally catalog what's on Earth so that we can go to Mars and figure out what's there, too. So, um, and you'll kind of get a mini bacteriology degree along the way or microbiology degree, I'd say. So, uh, thank you all very much. And uh, thank, thank you, Grace. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Chris. Thanks, Chris and Mary. Talk to you, talk to you soon. All right. Yeah. Um, so I am going to share my screen. Uh, let me introduce myself uh, formally. Uh, my name is Maria Sierra. Um, here is also Krista Ryan. Uh, we've been working in the micro directory for a while. Uh, I'll say about almost two years, right? And um, so as you can see, the Mason lab, uh, it's uh, a pretty diverse um, lab, especially in terms of uh, projects. Uh, but we have something in common in, is that uh, we work with a lot of multi-omics um, uh, technologies. So, so just one question, can everyone hear me okay with the mask on? <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so since we have all of these projects with metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, uh, multi-omics in general. All these we, big, big words. <laughs> yes, yes, and big, big data, uh, big list of microbes. And we started looking at um, all of these microbes that we got from, especially from the subways uh, studies. And uh, I'm gonna write it, multi-omics. So, um, when we started getting all the results from uh, metagenomic analysis, we got a huge list of micro microbes and we were wondering, okay, what was each one of those? And it was a list of more than the ta like 10,000 of microbes and, and we just couldn't go one by one and figure out what they were, if they were. Uh, uh, for example, in the case of bacteria, they were gram positive, gram negative, and this was important for us to understand the ecology of these microbes. So that's when all the micro directories started to to uh, to 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 be born. Um, so so this project uh, it started with Heba um, actually, and there were about 50 volunteers who collected data manually. So we've been working since then, uh, expanding the micro directory and making it um, not only with more annotations, but also with more features and um, uh, relevant features that could help us to understand the microbiomes of all of these studies. So I'm gonna share my screen and- Maria, I'm just gonna add a little bit, if yeah. that's all right. Sure. Um, so, um, so we've actually didn't um, start the micro directory as uh, Maria said, uh, the micro directory has been around um, for a little while since 2017, 16. And it started with uh, one of our um, former coworkers, now medical student, uh, Heba Shaban. And we um, joined the project last year, um, actually over a year now, and just decided to expand upon it uh, Marie and I have been with the Mason Lab for well over a year now, working on different projects. Um, I myself work uh, with the MetaSub project on the subway sampling, um, international subway sampling, as well as the um, Extreme Microbiome project. And I do a lot of work with um, uh, data analysis as well as wet lab work um, on the bench. Uh, so. Uh, we both come from uh, very different backgrounds within the lab, um, uh, but we're, uh, this project really is a um, group effort. Um, Marie and I are the uh, leaders, but we work with a few different people in the lab, as well as um, you guys 
who are going to really not only contribute to this project, but really be part of this project. Yes, so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what the micro directory is and how it's organized and what will be your uh, participation in this study. So, um, okay, so I think, wait, are you, wait, hold on. Yeah, I think you are seeing the, okay, does it look good now? Okay, good. And if anybody so, has questions, um, just uh, put them in the chat and we'll, I'll either address them during um, the presentation or uh, at a certain point. All right. So the micro directory is basically a database of uh, uh, microbial annotations and characteristics. And this database is on a web browser that you can go on and you can search a, a specific species that you're looking for. Uh, if, for example, we're looking for E. coli and um, then you write E. coli and a bunch of microbes will appear and then you will select the one that you're interested on and you'll get some information about E. coli. You will get the taxonomy, you'll get uh, information about the pH, the temperature, pathogenicity and so on. So um, this work uh, was first published in, um, in 2018, uh, was led by HEBA, as, as we said before. And we saw that this, this um, uh, database was really um, of, of a high interest by, uh, from researchers, not only microbiologists in the medical field, but also in other fields like biotechnology, ecology, and so on. So we started looking at how could we expand the, the, this, this database. And just so we have uh, clear the importance of the microdirectory, I am uh, pointing some, uh, some, like some characteristics of the microdirectory and why this is of uh, relevance for the uh, microbiology field in general. So this data is first is accessible and you can go through a, a single database and find uh, information from uh, different, uh, um, different microbial groups. So for example, you'll find information about viruses, you'll find information about bacteria, fungi in just one single database. This database has been quality check, meaning that uh, the information that you, the, res uh, the volunteers, research volunteers, or any other collaborator, they send us the information and we make sure that the information is reliable, uh, not only because we, we need that data for our studies, but we also want to give that to the community uh, and they can rely on the, on the data. Um, so this database is useful for individuals searching information about a particular species in the case of E. coli, for example, or it can also work for downstream analysis, large scale metagenomic analysis, um, like the ones that we just saw with uh, Dr. Chris Mason, uh, with uh, Metasub, for example, where we get a huge list of microbes and we need to understand all of the characteristics of those microbes in order to test hypotheses. So we'll, we'll see if, for example, uh, the abundance of certain extremophiles is different depending on the microbiome or depending on where we took the sample and so on. So we decided to, um, we decided to to um, sorry, organize the microdirectory in the following um, structure. So we have right now in the microdirectory five microbial groups. We have bacteria and an archaea. Uh, we have fungi. We have virus, and we decided to include microalgae. And within microalgae, we have the group of diatoms, which is one of the biggest groups in in algae. Um, I don't know what's going on with this mouse, sorry. Um, can you see the whole screen? Because I, I can um, 
somehow it's a little crop yeah it looks great it looks fine okay okay good okay so as you can see each group each microbial group has some characteristics so some characteristics are unique for uh given uh, a microbial group such as gramistanin gramistanin only applies for bacteria uh, the oxygen use and the metabolism and some other characteristics are uh, more common um, on the different groups so for example the ability to form spores uh, it's shared by bacteria and microfungi or the biofilm uh, formation um, and um, for example the different types of uh, microbiome all of this all, each one of these uh, items are on the coda doc that you should have read already uh, we have tried to explain each one of these uh, definitions as simple as possible. Uh, so whenever you read an article, you understand what you are reading. And um, if you, after you read the Coda doc and you have any questions, uh, feel free to use the Coda doc, uh, the Slack, sorry, um, to ask a any question. Uh, we'll try to make it um as understandable as possible so in i'm going to show you some a uh, few results like very uh briefly about what we have collected uh, um, during the previous two cycles of the micro directory we have about twenty thousand uh, microbial submissions and uh we have um after we have collected all this information, thanks to you, we have to start um, compiling the data, cleaning the data, in order for us to start um, analyzing the data and uploading, uploading it to the database. But just to show you how this is looking, um, for example, we have a, here the annotations for bacteria and fungi. And you can see that uh, we have collected, collected uh, some um, characteristics we have annotated some characteristics more than others so for example um, uh, let's see here this corresponds to uh, if the bacteria is an extremophile you can see that the majority are not extremophiles uh, this for example is the gram stain if it's gram stain positive negative um, this um, this is the um the the microbiome if it if it the microbiome is a host uh, what type of host is it uh if it's in the human it's if it's uh in a gastrointestinal tract or uh, the oral cavity uh, for example we have the ability to form spores um, and so on um, for example here which is um, pretty interesting for all of this um, space genomics. Um, we have information about what type of extremophile uh, the bacteria is. We have we see that the majority that we have annotated are thermophiles, sacrophiles, and allophiles, which means you know hot temperatures, cold temperatures, and high salinity. And for fungi. Uh, similar to bacteria, we have annotated a bunch of characteristics. Um, you will see that some fungi are, some microbial species of fungi are um, mixed with macrofungi. So that's when you annotate if it's a macrofungi or a microfungi. And uh, we're gonna have the talk about fungi next uh, Tuesday. So, uh, if you can attend, I uh, recommend you to do so because we're going to uh, hear from experts in the taxonomy field of fungi and how we can differentiate between macro and micro fungi. Um, also, you'll find uh, some lichens on the list. We'll have tried to clean as much as possible this, this list, but if you are, uh, if, you, if you found that you have a lichen on your list, 
then you have to annotate that it's a lichen and that's fine. Um, and for example, for virus, we have uh, collected a really, really interesting in, um, information. So you can see the majority have uh, annotated that the virus that they, they are, um, they received is a pathogen. Um, we have the different um, places in the human host that the virus infects. So we have the, it, it kind of looks like the respiratory tract is the most abundant. Um, again, this is preliminary results. We still need to um, clean this data and then analyze it. Um, and we have some other characteristics of the virus and and that you just saw uh, this morning with Dr. Pradeep Ambrose, uh, if it's an envelope or naked, if it's double strain, single strain, and so on. So as you can see, the micro directory, uh, it's expanding and we, we want to have as many, as, as many species as possible, but the, uh, as, uh, the information should be uh, something that tells you that that explains the microbes. So I'm going to give you just a brief example. Uh, Dr. Mason kind of uh, briefly talked about this and we have a um, some projects with the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory at NASA uh, with Dr. Venkat and we saw that okay uh, there might be some microbial cargo in these clean rooms and as you can see um, well, the name says it all. The clean rooms are supposed to be clean and they have like extensive protocols for cleaning uh, in order to make these this spacecrafts uh, as clean as possible before launching to space. So why launch into space? In order to either um, protect, um, you know, when astronauts are in space, your immune system might react different uh, to these uh, conditions, like uh, the gravity is different. Even if they have like a gravity system, it's completely different. It's a, it's a, a closed environment um, and the temperature is different. Everything is different. Your diet is different. So you might react different to the microbes and we want to avoid sending uh, as many microbes as possible. Uh, as we want to send less, as, uh, how can I say, like, if it was sterile, it will be perfect, but it is not going to be a sterile, and we have found this through metagenomics, and um, also because we want to collect samples in Mars, for example, and we want to make sure that what, whatever we find in the samples, uh, it's from Mars, and it's not a contamination from, from a, the human that was assembling this, this um, spacecraft. So, after we took this, the samples from these clean rooms in the surfaces of these clean rooms, um, we found that there are multiple microbes that according to the micro directory might be a potential risk. And why is this? Because they have some characteristics such as uh, extremophilia, like they are, as you can see the, uh, the red, squares, this indicates that it's a psychrophilic um, microbe, meaning that it can tolerate um, low temperatures, or for example, that it's a radiophilic genus, uh, the orange, so it can tolerate um, radiation, or for example, the, uh, the purple squares, uh, that is a spore-forming uh, microbe, and this is, this is important because Sometimes when the when you're cleaning a surface, um, when you with UV or any chemical, the microbes might go into dormant state, and uh, they get into into spores, so they are less susceptible to these cleaning protocols. So we saw that they, because of the information that we were getting from the micro directory, we could. Uh, we could spot these microbes that, that, that were present in the cleaning rooms and might be a potential risk for this, um, these missions. So um, 
we have a goal for 2020. 2020 is almost over. And we have a goal of 80,000 microbial species. Uh, as you can see, we are uh, almost there. And um, this wouldn't be possible without your help. As you can see from two, uh, 2016, we increased uh, in many, many microbes in 2000, to 2019, uh, compiling information from public uh, uh, databases, other metagenomic studies, such as Metasub, the Earth Microbiome Project. And now what we are doing is we are uh, including, including new microbes, but we are also trying to complete the missing information from those uh, other microbes that we collected from, from last year. So um, as you can see, this is a huge task and this, this wouldn't be possible without your help. Um, your help with manual annotations is it's fundamental for the project. Uh, we have a um, team of computer scientists uh, and researchers um, that contribute to the uh, analysis of this data. And <clears throat> we also use, as I said, public databases and other studies to compile um, data into our database. So it's a really a team effort, this, all, all of this. Um, so this cycle is going to be from next week, which is uh, Monday, October 12th, to the week of 28th of December. And um, um, we want to acknowledge your work in the micro directory. Many of you do this because this is your first uh, research, research experience or because, um, you know, because you, you want to learn about microbes or just because, you know, you're going to uh, med school or PhD and you want to have some experience um, before going to grad school. So we understand that and we want to acknowledge uh, your effort and um, for your contributions, um, we of course will give you acknowledgement in the um, future manuscripts that come from um, the analysis of all this data. Um, for example, if you work two weeks, three weeks, and after that you realize you don't really have time, don't worry, we understand that, um, that sometimes uh, you just can't do it anymore. So we'll, we'll still acknowledge your work. But if you continue with us, uh, I know that there are people that have been volunteering since January. Um, we want to make you part of a big consortium that we are creating of volunteers and collaborators um, all over the world. And um, this will be the micro directory consortium. And once we get all this, um, data analyze and we start with the with the uh, manuscript writing and analysis uh, we can notify you and we can tell you okay we have we we're starting to um, to compile the manuscript do you want to make any contributions and if you make any contributions you can you can be also a co-author co in this in this manuscripts um, many many of you have asked me through emails about uh, co-authorship and this not only um, uh, depends on, on your execution on the task, because it's not about completing the 10 microbes that you're getting each week. It's about doing it right, getting the information, as much, as, as much information as possible. Uh, there are microbes that will have very few um, articles or no information at all. That's fine. Um, and, but once we get all, all of this, uh, all, all of the annotations from the cycle, from this cycle, um, which is going to be probably the first week of January that we finish, um, we hope to compile everything that we have collected this year and then start to compile, um, to, to get, to put together the manuscript. And that's when we, we will tell you, okay, we have, um, we are starting to write manuscript. Do you want to contribute? And of course, those people that 
want to do extra analysis or want to contribute with the writing can do so and and they can be acknowledged in the co-authorship um, so we understand that for the new volunteers this might be like a, a lot um, a lot of work and it might be a little um, difficult the first couple of weeks um, but um, you can ask other volunteers that after some after a while you get used to it and you get experience reading um, databases and research articles and it gets easier and easier and we are here to help you uh, but we also require some commitment from you and this is three simple things the first thing is be constant weekly submission to send we, we send microbes every monday and we expect you to complete them before the next monday um, we don't want you to have at the end of the of, of the month you haven't you haven't finished any of your weekly tasks and then you have you will have 40 microbes to do in just one week we don't we don't want that we we'd rather you um finishing all the microbes before the next week we understand that some weeks are might be more might be busier for you because you have exams or because you have family um, events or any personal issue we understand that and we will encourage you to email us before so we know that you will be a little um, delayed with your um, weekly submission um, something Let that me we just, have uh, I'm just gonna add in um, so I, I know a, um, we have some volunteers thanks we're um, returning uh, from the summer and um, you know, everyone's getting back into school if you are enrolled uh, this semester. Um, so if you do know that you have um, like a midterm coming up or um, like a big project and, you know, in advance um, and that you really won't have the time, again, you know, if, if you do have the time, that's great. But if you really know that you have finals coming up, just you know, give us a heads up. Uh, we're we're always checking email, Slack. So um, just you know, let us know, and we'll work with you to make sure that um, you'll be able to get your work done. Yes. So I am looking at the chat right now. We will try to have office hours the first um, the first month. So we go through all of these questions that uh, may come by. Uh, reading the articles or a submitting your microbes um so we'll put the office hours um table on the coda dog so if you haven't joined the slack channel i will encourage you to do so because we share everything through slack and any news any updates everything is through slack um and just another side note, some of you had trouble with the Hunter email, not receiving our emails. Um, if you haven't changed your Hunter email, I'll recommend to change it. I mean, to send you, to send us a, an alternate email because we have seen that sometimes you might get, you know, some issues, technical issues with the Hunter email. And I think it's because we have a system, automatic system of sending um, the microbes. And it might be uh, that the Hunter email is, is not recognizing it as a um, real email and maybe like a spam email or something. So um, please email us with your alternate email, either Gmail, Hotmail, any other email. Um, all right, so uh, with this, uh, continuing with this, we have a, something that we call the honorary code. And this is what, what we were discussing, to search carefully and make your best effort to annotate the, the microbial data. And um, we have seen that not many volunteers, but some few volunteers just, you know, just want to finish with the microbial 
the microbes of the week and they just click NA, unknown, and goodbye. So we don't want this. We want you to take your time and, um, but we don't want you to go to the other, uh, to the other extreme side where you are spending like a whole day, you know, stressing out because you haven't found any information about um, biofilm forming of a bacteria. This is not the point. If you have um, searched for a while, I'll say 30 minutes and you haven't found anything, you can move into the next question and um, you can annotate that as NA, NA or unknown, depends, uh, it depends on how um, it applies. You can find this on the Coda doc as well. And I'll recommend you to watch the YouTube uh, videos on to how to annotate the microbes. Um, we have examples on how to annotate a lichen or a bacteria, archaea, and so on. And uh, finally, we, we encourage you to submit citations for every single answer that you put on your on your COBO form, and um, and this is because um, we want to put that on the web page. So whenever a researcher goes to the web page and finds certain information, and they want to know more about that a specific. Uh, characteristic, they can go through the source of the information and easily find it. Um, all right, so as I said earlier, we have different channels. Uh, we have the CODA doc, which is a uh, document where we have all the submission steps, the microbial definitions, uh, some frequently asked questions, and we have some useful links. Um, so in this session, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through the CODA, um, but if you have a specific question about CODA, feel free to, um, Slack us, um, and we can discuss about that, but please make sure you read the whole document and make sure you, you join the Slack again. And if you have a, a specific matter that you'd like to discuss or you can, uh, you can uh, submit your microbial species uh, for any reason, feel free to uh, email us uh, in advance. And so we can figure it out. Um, Krista, do you have anything to add here? Um, as Maria said, uh, like these are very useful, um, like these are, contacts like things you use to kind of contact us like please use them um, we will be definitely sending emails we will be on we are on slack and um, the coda I feel like um, we've just updated the coda the coda it has so much information on it so if you really do have a question that can't be uh, they can't find online um, please go to the coda first and look through it uh, before going to email or Slack. Of course, we'll answer your uh, questions either way, uh, but there's definitely plenty of useful information there. Um, uh, so I'd say check that out first before resorting to searching online uh, for some uh, standard questions. And okay, and as uh, you can see, we have a uh, some members of the micro directory here, but there are more members in the uh, in the project. Uh, we have um, um, David Danko, also Heba, um, our volunteers who has joined the project uh, more um, they're in more detail. They have helped us with uh, with the definitions, with the other volunteers, Hardik and Radua, and of course to the whole, the micro directory consortium. Um, and I'll be happy to answer some, any questions.
Uh, Maria, I do have some things um, regarding the Coco Toolbox. Um, okay. Um, so um, if anybody has questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Uh, we'll just be going a little bit more into the presentation and uh, uh, very shortly we'll be done. Um, all right, um, so as uh, Maria uh, mentioned briefly, uh, you will all be submitting data through a browser called Kobo Toolbox. You will all be receiving a user and password from us. Unless you are a previous volunteer, then you already have a user and password and you'll be using that one for this uh, cycle. So I'm gonna share my screen and just go into some information about it. Let's see. You, uh, the new volunteers will receive the username and the password on Monday with their microbial annotations. Yes. Okay, can everyone see my screen? It should just say Kobo Toolbox in the browser. Yes. Okay, great. So, um, great. So, how's everyone doing? Hanging, hanging with me. All right, we're going to go into Kobo Toolbox really quickly. So when you receive your um, microbial annotations, you're gonna see 10 annotations and your Kobo Toolbox user and login. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is go to the Kobo Toolbox site. You could simply go and search Kobo Toolbox or you could go on the Coda and click the link there. Um, it's fairly accessible. It should be one of the first things you see when you search up. Um, and you'll basically see a screen like this. Um, Kobo Toolbox is a great site that's used for data collection around the world. They are supporting uh, humanitarian responses for uh, COVID-19 um, and a lot of different projects. It actually started it through a Harvard initiative, um, but uh, it, now it is widely accessible and it's uh, free. So uh, it's a really great, uh, uh, application to use for uh, data collection and even analysis. Um, so you don't need to sign up. We'll have your username and login, as I said, sent to you and you'll scroll down and you'll be pressing here, researchers, aid, workers, and everyone else for your log and uh, we're not using the humanitarian uh, form. So if you do end up pressing this one, your username and login will not work. So once you do that, um, you should be able to see a screen. Let me just move this around. You should be able to see a screen like this. Uh, for this cycle, you will be using a deployed form called the microdirectory data entry form, uh, fall through winter, this, that is this cycle. And in order to uh, enter data, you'll simply need to click this and it will go into your profile for this form. Um, as you can see, um, there isn't much here. It says zero submissions. This is exactly what everyone should see upon first opening their form. Before you even get into the form, you can actually preview it here. Preview it. It will load for me. And you can briefly see what the form will look like. It's a standard data entry form. Um, we have our link to our GitHub if you need any further information. Um, but here you could just preview the form. If you click anything here, nothing should, um, you won't be like submitting anything. It's just, you know, to see what the form looks like. If you want to actually collect data, you will be Clicking open here. And can everyone still see my screen? Yes, yes. Great. So this is what the form looks like. You'll be putting the scientific name of your microbe in here, uh, followed by the domain. So let's say we're working with Esterica coli. We enter it here and it's a bacteria and you'd be going into each question uh, one by one. 
and submitting your form. Uh, it's fairly simple. Um, as Maria mentioned, we do have unknown and NA um, as an option for many of these questions. So it's really important to know the difference. Unknown being the um, information is just not there. Uh, it's unknown. It's, it's not out there yet. The research hasn't been done. The research isn't found. Or um, NA meaning it's just it's not applicable for this uh, this microbe. It, it, this question doesn't apply at all. So all of this is explained in the uh, Coda doc, and yes. also there is a tutorial a lot of all of this that Krista is talking, um, explaining. Um, so you can go back to the Coda doc and just uh, refresh everything. So, oops, not that one, this one. So, um, as Mary was just saying, yeah, we do have a Kobo toolbox instructions on the CODA. It goes again through login, accessing the form, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I do recommend um, going through this. Um, we go through if you're having login problems, if you're having problems accessing the form, uh, some of the specific questions as well as um, if you submit and you see a problem. Um, we've added some frequently asked questions. So um, please go through these if uh, you have a problem because the answer just might right, be right there. Um, let me just go back to here for a second. Right. Sorry, one minute. Okay, so when you're in your form, um, you'll see this little asterisk next to some of the questions. That means the question is required. So if you don't answer one of these questions, so let's say if I press submit right now, um, it will not let you submit your form. So it will show up in red where you need to submit and put in um, the information. We're also, also asking everyone to enter their full name into the Kobo toolbox form. And that is just so we have your annotation and we know what is. Um, just make sure you use the same iteration of your name every time um, and do include your last name. Um, um, and there is a question yes. here, uh, Krista, um, right. for a volunteer that says that the COBOL toolbox form says summer fall in her. Um, um, that is a. Um, no worries, that's great. So actually this form has not been shared to any of the volunteers yet. It will be shared before uh, before Monday, before you receive your username and login. So don't worry if you're a previous volunteer and you're working with the summer form, um, you will be able to see this by next week when it becomes available and you'll be able to enter your submissions. So that is a great question. Um, but yes, you should be able to see the fall to winter one uh, following uh, receiving your username and password. Um, and uh, just so I don't forget this little um, thing is when you do receive your microbes, you'll be receiving 10 and just copy and paste the name into the box um, just so we have the exact uh, uh, way that uh, we have it in the database. Uh, we pull all the microbes names from um, NCBI and we're using it to uh, pull it back, that data back into um, the microbes. So make sure you paste it um, exactly the way it looks. Uh, I know this is a lot of information, so I do hold office hours. Um, I will be starting my office hours up again next week um, and for the next uh, 12 weeks unless I um, specify otherwise uh, every Friday from 9 to 10 
uh, regarding Kobo Toolbox. Uh, if you can meet me during that time, you could just send me an email or send an email to the microdirectory um, and I can work with you. Uh, all right, and I'll uh, take uh, any questions um, or Maria, you have anything else to add? Um, I think I don't, um, but there is one question here. Um, if I find information, uh, conflict information from a specific feature like Ramistain, for example, how can I proceed? And this is a really important question. This uh, might happen multiple times during your research. And um, the way you should proceed is, in the case of drama stain, for example, it should be either negative or positive, right? So let's say you found information um, in one database that it says negative, but in other articles, it says positive. So we will encourage you to do some things. First, um, try to search other resources, other articles, other databases, and see what's uh, the, the average answer. If just one page, one database is uh, has the conflict uh, answer, then you can rely into the articles and citate the articles on the form. But if after a while you are still confused because you're finding like different answers, just reach out to us through Slack and we can address that uh, specifically. So, okay, another question, will this meeting be uploaded to Slack or YouTube? We'll try to upload everything in YouTube, um, probably by the end of the next week. So in case you have uh, missed any, uh, a, a specific talk, you can go through the YouTube channel and just watch it. Um, if a certain citation can be referenced, uh, sometimes it keeps saying, on Sotero, that is an error. Usually these errors, we have an example in the Coda doc, why this might happen. And this is because Sotero needs a link through the, um, of the article. For example, in, a, in the case of an article, Sotero needs a link where the article is safe, which is the journal webpage. And you'll need to copy either the DOI or the link uh, of the journal where the article is. So, Ther so Thero will give error when you will paste the link of a PDF. Whenever you give the link of a PDF, it will give you error. So you can go through CODA, the guidelines, uh, and you'll find this example. And if the error con uh, persists, you can reach out through Slack. Mm. Uh that actually brings up a good point. Um, there are some uh, articles and publications you might not have access to. Um, uh, a big part of the micro directory is making sure that data is free and available to everyone. Another reason why we're doing this to give people this resource. Um, so if you, and uh, we do have access to certain articles through our institution, so if you do, um, uh, need access to something and you don't have access to it, uh, please uh, reach out to us and we can help you uh, possibly get access to um, an article or publication. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, another question here, uh, for example, a having an error with Sotero with a web page, um, you can use, you can enter the, the citation manually in Sotero. So you can have the, um, the citation style that we are um, um, compiling from Sotero. We do not accept other uh, formats such as deep text. Uh, and this is because we want to keep consistency among all of the submissions that we have. Um, if you have a particular issue Again, feel free to reach out through Slack. Maybe other volunteer has the same issue. Uh, and uh, really quickly, um, I don't know if Maria, uh, do you want to ask um, if any previous volunteer just wants to speak to their um, own experience um, starting out the micro directory? Sure. Um, so we have some previous volunteers here in the call. I'm trying to see. 
um, maybe Hardik, would you like to to give your uh, advices and your opinion about the project, about your experience? <clears throat> I don't know if Hardik is in the call. Oh, his Wi Fi isn't really bad. Um, if you do want to, um, you know, talk about the project. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Tina, you know, go ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry. Like, the Wi Fi is really bad here, but um, <laughs> I've loved my experience uh, at the micro directory. I've learned a lot. Um, and the lectures that uh, Maria and Krista have put together are really amazing. Um, so I highly suggest going to them. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free, uh, you know, to contact me, Radwa, or, you know, any of the other volunteers. We kind of created a family here at the micro directory, and it's, it's, it's really awesome. And I'm excited to work with everyone. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Hardik. Uh, Tina, do you want to say some, some, uh, something? Yeah, sure. Hi. Um, so I've started off at the su um, during summer working with the microbe team. Um, it's been actually really fun. I really, really like it um, because you learn just so much about all these informations. Um, I would suggest for all the new volunteers to actually go on the microbe YouTube site. Um, Maria and Crystal and Hardik and I know a lot of the other volunteers, they um, thankfully posted up um, like sample of like inputting information with the specific like bacteria or virus and watching those videos before you're assigned to a specific um, microbe would be very helpful because they go through different um, sort of scenarios that you might hit. For instance, if you don't, can't find out like um, if the um, bacteria is a biofilm or not. Um, and that was actually really helpful for me when they uploaded it. Um, I would also use those websites that they have on the Coda doc. Those websites are actually a very good sort of ground base to um, be able to use as um, sort of initial websites to look for everything. And then you can also look at through Google or especially Google Scholar. There's also a lot of, um, you can find a lot of PDFs of different scientists like um, working on the, like the bacteria, the viruses that they, that you're, you might be annotating. But um, it might be hard at first. It was difficult for me at first. Um, trying to sort of go through like a whole document to be able to find certain information. But um, <laughs> I would suggest using the control F button. That would actually really help a lot <laughs> for different articles. But um, you'll get used to it after the first two weeks and you'll get the hang of it. And um, as they all said, that all the volunteers are always here to help you guys. Everyone's here to we're all sort of like a community. If you guys have any questions, definitely use Slack, email anybody. Um, everyone's really, really nice, which is really great. That's just made the experience really better. So yeah. Thank you, Tina. Thanks. Um, so yeah, as, as we have said, uh, don't feel afraid or shy to just reach out to us. Um, we'll try to answer as soon as possible. Um, and if, for example, you have a very uh, urgent issue, uh, feel free to ping, ping us again uh, through the uh, different channels. So if there are no other questions, um, I'd like to share briefly a project that we are starting in the, in the Mason Lab. And um, I heard that uh, someone wrote me in the private channel, but I cannot find it. How can we get uh, into, you know, the project, either the micro directory of, or this, this other project that I'm gonna show you, um, how can we get to work uh, more, you know, closely to the data and uh, to the analysis? And this is very important because there is always something to do, right? And we um, encourage you, if you have experience, for example, with either R or Python analyzing data or data creation or statistical analysis, we'll uh, uh, appreciate your help in this. Uh, there is a lot to analyze. So if you wanna help on that, feel free to reach out to us. Um, 
And I'm going to share my screen, as I said, very briefly, another project that we are going to work, uh, we're going to start now. And can you all see my screen? Yep. Okay. Oh, wait, sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. So um, this project is called MetaCats, and we are aiming to study the coronaviruses and microbial communities in domestic cats. And this is, uh, we're going to do this through, as we said earlier, multi-omics, meaning metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, and um, we want to dep depict the, all of this microbiota of these um, animals that are always in close contact with us, with humans. So for this, um, we are following the uh, a very simple protocol and we basically need volunteers with cats. It could be your family, it could be your friends, it could be anyone that you know that has a cat can register to get a kit. The kit is free, we send the kit to your house. And basically what we will need you to do is to get a two samples from your cat, a saliva sample and a stool sample. After that, you will complete a short survey. Actually, it is through Kobo, who will send you a, um, some, uh, the link to go through Kobo and you'll fill out the information about your cat, uh, if your cat is indoor, outdoor, what does it eat, and other, other cat questions. <laughs> and then we'll analyze the samples, and when, once we have everything analyzed, everything ready, um, and you, you might get your samples if you want them, just out of curiosity to see what your, the microbiota of your cat is. You can register, in the webpage, and the webpage is uh, um, metasub.org, metacats, slash metacats. Um, and if you have a specific question about metacats, all the information about the project is on the webpage. I'm gonna share the, the link through the Slack too, in case you, you want to, to go through it. Uh, but if you have a question, you can reach out to either me or Krista through our emails or to the uh, metacats.usa um, uh, at gmail.com. Um, and that is it. Thanks a lot for um, your attention. Uh, if you have any questions about cats. Uh, and okay, there is someone that says there are tons of stray cats where I live. I don't know if I can collect much of them though. Um, Stray cats might be difficult because um, they might be, you know, a little uh, reactive to the human contact. So we'll encourage you to to uh, sample cats that, you know, like your friends, your family, so you can collect information about about um, the cat. So if you get a cat from the a stray cat, you won't get information about what does it eat. Uh, what's the the weight and and if it has any vaccines and so on so we'll encourage you to to do it uh just with uh cats that you know from a friend or a family we are as for now we're only collecting uh in the usa not outside but if everything goes well with the project, we can expand the samples collection to other countries. Um, so are there any other questions? Again, I'll send you the link through Slack in case you didn't uh, uh, write it down. Um, so you can register there and we can send you a kit to your house. Um, this is totally free again. You won't have to pay the kit or the shipping. We pay everything. All right. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for attending to this talk. Remember, we have a talk on 
Tuesday about fungi. It's going to be a really great talk with two um, professors um, that work with my, um, microfungi taxonomy. So it will be really helpful for you to understand all of this, um, this microbial group. So thanks a lot, everyone. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, reach out to Slack. Thank you, everyone, and have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. We'll be in touch shortly. Enjoy the weekend. Bye-bye.